Father God, I thank you that we come into your presence this morning. And Lord, we just pray deep in our hearts. Just soften our hearts. Do a new thing in us this day, we pray. Come, Lord Jesus. Let us worship you. Amen. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. And the Lord is good to all, He has compassion for all that He has made. and compassionate so to anger and rich in love the Lord is gracious and compassionate so to anger and rich in of 
the coming day Cold as stone they fell and lost their way In the dream you lay as hope was gone Doubt so tangible and worn in song It was impossible for death to hold you down. Your name is Jesus, and you wear the victory crown. We join with heaven to declare eternal praise. Sing, holy is your. We're going to sing our family song together now, and Rebecca's going to come and lead the actions to carry the light. Oh God, your love goes on, it has no end, and when I'm down, your love we smile again It's deeper than the sea I as a kite I feel it all around me Like a glowing light So take me And shake me Your will be done In my heart today Oh lead me So we see The kingdom come I want to dance and sing I'm going to make it loud Louder than everything So when this world is dark Than the longest night My love shine through me I'm going to go Going to carry the light Oh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh. oh God, your love's more strong then all my fear, I'm standing proud and so knowing you are here in every word I say and speak and write. I know your love will shine on through so clear and bright. So take me and shake me, your will be done in my heart today. Oh, lead me so we see. Your love 
Well done, everybody. Let me pray. Father, thank you for our children and young people, and we pray that you would be with them as they go to their groups today, that they would learn more of what it means to be a disciple of yours, a follower of Jesus. And we pray it in your precious name, Lord. Amen. We're going to remain standing. Guys, go and have a great time. We'll see you at the end of the service. God bless. Let's continue to worship.
for Jesus bled and suffered for my part and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this I hold my sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my plea all the chains are released I can see this brand new day. Thank you for this time set aside each week when we can come together and worship and praise you. May your spirit fall in this room. We confess that we have often failed you and miss opportunities to seek your will in our lives. In the words of the general confession, we have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have left undone those things we ought to, sorry, we've left undone those things we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. We are sorry, Lord, for the times this week when we've messed up, but we ask, Lord, for another chance for us and for the world we live in. We pray, Lord, as we take part in the trial of the new tier fund resource, that we will learn new ways to care for your world and to think carefully about the choices we make. Help us to reflect, pray and change our habits. We have learnt in previous weeks that Moses prayed while Joshua fought the battle. We come as Moses this morning to hold up our hands in prayer for those fighting battles. We lift up our hands in prayer for Simon and the Great Lakes Outreach Scheme, fighting against trafficking in Burundi. May we listen carefully and learn how we can help in that battle. Thank you for Simon and the team. We lift up our hands in prayer for those battling with words for peace between Russia and Ukraine. For peace in Afghanistan, Yemen and other worn torn areas of your world. We lift up our hands in prayer for those struggling to feed themselves and their families. We pray against governments who find funds for wars, but not for feeding their populations. 
we lift up our hands in prayer for our police force. May a new commissioner be chosen that will bring unity and right practice to the force so that every member of society can feel safe at their hands. We lift up our hands in prayer for our NHS. We pray for all those caring for others would know peace and rest. We pray for breakthrough experiences for those involved in research against things like cancer, arthritis, MMD, heart disease, and many other life-giving, life-threatening complaints. Thank you, Lord, for our carers, doctors, nurses, paramedics, physios, and the administrators. Thank you for the privilege we have of living here in West London, where care is so locally available, and we think of those parts of the world where help is so far away. We lift up our hands in prayer for hospices, especially for those in our area, Meadow House, the Michael Sobel Hospice at Ryslip, and St Luke's in Harrow. Thank you for the care they give at such difficult times in the lives of their patients and families. May they not be constrained by lack of funds. Comfort those who mourn. And Lord, we lift up our hands in prayer for Chris and Lily. Surround them with your protecting, strengthening, all-powerful love. May they know your presence with them every moment of every day. We pray for the service on Friday. May this, be a truly, may this truly be a celebration of the life of the, of the beautiful Nell. When Moses tired, the battle went against Joshua. We ask, Lord, that, you wouldn't, that we would not tire of praying for these and all matters that you put on our hearts. As we go into this new week, we ask that you will help us not to miss opportunities to show your love to those around us. Amen. Amen. Do please take a seat. Thank you, Jane. Love to highlight a few things. Perhaps I could start by just um, uh, reminding you that um, for those who are able to come, this Friday, 2 o'clock, we'll be celebrating Nell Fox's life here. And um, you are most welcome and invited. If you would like to do something towards that, we'd love some help with hospitality. So we're looking for offers of people to bake cakes or biscuits and things so that we can provide a lovely place for people to engage and talk afterwards. So if you're able to do that, please do just let us know so that we know stuff's coming in. You can email me, that's fine, um, so that we know what we're gathering as a church. This, uh, this Tuesday we have Hungary, and for those who don't know, Hungary is a night where we come together as a community in sort of prayer and worship. And this Tuesday we have a special kind of week because we have New Wine coming to kind of lead a, what we call like a live-streamed event, but it's about prayer and prophecy. And a guy called Mark Aldridge is going to be leading that. So it's going to be a brilliant evening and just encourage you maybe as a life group or just individually, individually to come along to that. It starts at 8 o'clock in the church. It's free to come. Come and just participate as you can. And if you're a young adult, there'll be a meal served from 6.30 to 8, just before that in the foyer. So again, just a great opportunity to come and be community um, as young, young adults together. And then secondly, um, this, well, this week, starting kind of tomorrow, we're taking part in something called the Tear Fund uh, Climate Challenge. And if you want to know more, this is the moment you can get out your phone and as Mark says, get onto the St. Paul's app. We have a dedicated um, sort of information there on the Tear Fund Challenge. Or you can pick up a sheet at the back of church which tells you more. But basically, in simple terms, we're just going to do some simple steps 
different each day, just to, to join in and make us think a little bit about the climate and what we can be doing to make a difference. And I think tomorrow starts with a travel challenge. You know, what's the one thing you could do differently in terms of how you travel? And then each day there'll be a different theme. So as a church, we'd love to encourage everyone to join in in whatever way you can. So just find out more information, maybe grab the sheet at the back before you go. And um, could I invite uh, any who've not been to the next welcome meal? It's happening a week tomorrow, Monday the 28th. If you've not been to a welcome meal, please do come. 7.30 in the foyer, a lovely meal will be served, and we're able to say a little bit about our vision and our values as a church, what we stand for, and most importantly, to get to know each other better. So if you've not been to a welcome meal, please do sign up at the welcome desk today. Um, Phil and Sue George are there, and they would love to sign you up for that meal um, after the service today. And then uh, an advance notice on the 12th of March, there is an awakened breakfast for the women of the church. Lauren Windle's coming to speak. She is an amazing speaker. She has her own story of alcohol and drug addiction. She's been dry now for, I think, seven years or so, but she is inspiring to hear um, as she shares of her faith and her journey uh, of that. So um, if you are a woman and can sign up for that breakfast, do sign up for that. Details are on the website. Details of everything we say are all on the website um, as well. Yeah, it's my pleasure now to read some bands of marriage. So I published the bands of marriage between James Trevor Hall of the parish of St. Peter's Fundersley and Sophie Mary Ruby Raffin of the parish of St. Paul's Ealing. I'm looking around. I don't think you were here this morning. No, doesn't matter. And also between Stephen Daniel Pachow and Louise Olivia Clark of the parish of St. Thomas Hanwell and on the electoral roll of St. Paul's Church Ealing. These are for the second time of asking if anyone knows of any reason why these couples should not marry, then they are to declare them now. I can see Stephen and Louise. Why don't we pray for them? Lord, we thank you so much for James and for Safie, for Stephen and Louise. And Lord, we just pray your blessing over them as they prepare to do married life together. Lord Jesus, draw near to them, we pray. Be in their every plan and every thought. Amen. Julia is now going to come and bring our reading. Good morning. Our Bible reading today is taken from Matthew's Gospel. It's chapter 25 and reading verses 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps. But the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, Believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. Thanks, Julia. And it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Simon this morning. Simon is our guest speaker. Simon uh, leads the ministry called Glow in Burundi that we collected for at Christmas. Um, and has been a friend of St. Paul's for a long, long time. I think, Simon, you first came to speak here when I 
uh, soon after I arrived, actually, which was nearly 29 years ago. So uh, that's quite a long time. And um, uh, I've been out in Burundi and seen the work, and it's an amazing work that Simon's involved in. So let's give Simon a welcome this morning. Thanks, bro. And let's pray for him. Father, bless this man as he speaks to us today that we too might be sharpened in our faith. Use him, Lord, to declare something of your goodness to us this day. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Mark. And uh, can I say the most heartfelt, massive thank you. If you're, frankly, I, I didn't really believe it, the generosity of it. 23 grand you guys raised at Christmas, which is, which is mind-blowing. I mean, we get collections from a few churches that support us. I mean, I'm very happy for three grand, for four grand, for seven grand. 23 grand. I was like, are you for real? Um, and, and that... On one level is a number to you folks, but I think the reason you're so generous was that Mark broke it down in terms of saying 250 quid could get a sewing machine, which could get a lady out of prostitution, out of sexual trafficking, all that sort of stuff, which is so quantifiable, isn't it? Which makes sense to us in terms of, wow, we can make such a difference with relatively little. When I broke that news to the guys out there, they, I don't want to say they wet themselves, but they kind of wet themselves. You know, it was just so overwhelming to think that, you know, that is... That is precious, precious ladies that, and I've, you know, I've got lots of prostitutes that are my, are my friends. Um, and, you know, did you, I've got a five-year-old, well, I think of my daughter when she was five. Um, and, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up, baby? I want to be a prostitute. No, she didn't, no one says that, do they? The only reason a lady ends up doing that is because they have fallen through the cracks spectacularly. Either as orphans, widows, trying to provide for their kids, and... Uh, and so bless you for that. And then also a lot of the money also went to a vehicle. And the, the context I, I work in is very different from, from uh, Ealing. Um, but the guys said to me, Lord, when we finish, sometimes our outreach in our community and, um, and we're being stoned, particularly in, in, in Muslim areas, um, it'd be really helpful to have a vehicle to make a quicker getaway. Um, so it's a bit different, isn't it, from us here? Like, sometimes we're scared of sharing our faith, but it's, you know, the, the worst thing you'll ever get in England, from my experience, is, is no. You know, literally, it's, no, I'm not interested. Um, and I, I take people out quite a lot onto the streets to, talk, to, to share faith in a very winsome, easy way. The worst reaction I've ever had is no. I think we need to overcome our fear. And I've got lots of even very recent stories of seeing people come to faith on the streets. People are way more open than we think. But the two things, so thank you for the vehicle and thank you for, I mean, that is literally dozens of machines. The, the, the prostitutes that we had been helping to get out of uh, sexual trafficking and, and into more regular jobs. Uh, often, the, we had different sites, and they, were, they might be 13 sharing two machines. Well, you can't actually make a living when it's 13 sharing two machines, so now we can actually get them each one so they can be on it eight hours a day and, and make enough money to provide for themselves and their kids invariably, five or six kids in the mix. So bless you for that. Hopefully some pictures will come up on the screen. And by the way, I, th I, didn't, I didn't realize it, but my grandparents were also supported by this church. So that's Peter and Elizabeth Gilbert, who are long graduated to glory. They were rock stars in their own right, doing, you know, translated the Bible into the local language in the country to the north of me, Rwanda. So I'm in Burundi, they're in Rwanda. Next one. Hopefully. So there. So Mark came out, we did a cycle ride uh, from Bujumbra all the way around. Anyone get that? Any Brunians in the house? No? That's just a standard greeting out there. Next one. Uh, that's our charity. I don't want to dwell on that, but we're involved in all sorts of beautiful, uh, seriously nation and shaping stuff. Absolutely love it. Next one. And that's what the area is known for. So when I went out there back in 1999, it was the most dangerous country in the world. I expected to die. People tried to kill me. People I care about got killed. It was full on. It was very intense. And you might think, well, this must be horrible living. Brilliant place to live. Brilliant way to live. If you think you're going to die next week, you're not going to live the same way you're living right now. So lots of serious life lessons that I'll, as we look at the passage uh, in a second, uh, I'll share on that one. Next one. So anyway, peace did sort of come. Uh, we had 10 years of peace, 2005 to 2015, and then it sort of kicked off again, and it's, it's sort of, um, I don't want to say too much on it now, but it's, it's, it's an unhealthy uh, state and still lots of bad stuff going on. Uh, my DNA is how far is too far when Jesus went that far, and he went that far for all of us, whether it's in St. Paul's, in Ealing, wherever you come from right now, or, or, or Burundi, but that's my journey. I'm not on a recruiting drive for you to come out to Burundi. Uh, but all of us, how far is too far when he went that far? And he went that far, just not for us to be nice people. It's way, it's way bigger than that, isn't it? 
Uh, it's about being all in uh, for him. Next one. So you can get that afterwards if you wanted. That's a devotional. I've even got a recommendation on the back from a certain Mark Mellowish. Um, it was voted devotional of the year. So if you want a daily kick at the backside in terms of encouragement to be all in, you can get that at the back again. Next one. Uh, so that's our family during lockdown. We try to keep spirits up with different theme nights each Saturday. That was, uh, what was that? That was Star Wars, wasn't it? No, no. It wasn't. Um, look at my girl. I never get tired of telling the story. I've told it here before, but there's even a twist to it. So my girl there is named after the next one. I love this story. So this girl, she started her life down a toilet. She was thrown away by her mother. And the next person at the university hospital toilet saw this piece of flesh moving. They reached down. They picked her out of the toilet. Somehow she was still alive. Her neck had got caught in the U-bend of the toilet. And she was, um, she was cleaned off. And they got poo on themselves as they cleaned her off. And they fed her through a straw like a little bird weighing just a few pounds. Next one shows her 18 years later. Beautiful young lady, isn't she? Next one, she ends up being our babysitter. I love it. As God wove the tapestry of our lives together, she ended up being our babysitter. And my friend who rescued her gave her the most beautiful name. And when I married Lizzie, I was like, babes, if we're ever blessed with a daughter, I want to name I want to name our daughter after. So little white one is named after big black one there. They share the same name. The name is Grace. And I love that because that's the picture of my life and hopefully yours if you've turned to Jesus, is that it doesn't matter whether multi-emerging rapists, pillaging idiots in Central Africa or very self-absorbed people here in Ealing, we all need God's grace, don't we? And this is really important, some of us don't get this, but religion is thinking that that piece of flesh could possibly get out of the toilet by herself or that we could possibly reach God by ourselves. We can't, there's a massive chasm, he's perfect, we're not. We can't, we're incompatible, except that Jesus, who is God with flesh on, he's the incarnation, he comes down, he comes down, he reaches down, he picks us out of the toilet, metaphorical pit, and he cleans us off and he takes up on him so that we can be free and beautiful and acceptable and he can look at each one of us this morning and say, that's my girl, that's my boy, I love you, how much? that much. It's so powerful, grace. And that's available to all of us. And I love it, Grace, because next one, she ends up, we get her scholarship to America. She gets a distinction in her degree. Next one, she, well, she comes back and works for me in social media out there telling other Grace glory stories. Next one, this is the fresh bit. This is her just a month ago, starting off her master's in uh, Newcastle in, in counseling. That's her journey from the pit of a toilet. It's wild, isn't it? God can do anything. He can do anything with you this morning. I don't, you might be going through a hell of a time. He can do anything. And he's with you and you're grieving your pain or your brokenness, whatever it is. And it's all about grace ultimately. And that's what took me to, to Burundi. Next one. And Burundi is the hungriest country in the world. And this, to me, is a very moving pi picture because that four-year-old blonde-haired girl there, she's my Canadian friend's daughter, Alma. She's four years old. The next girl in the middle, half her size, is four years old or was four years old, and that's just, that's just wrong, isn't it? And that makes me weep, and that makes me angry. Two healthy emotions to have, which are compassionate. And God calls us to be compassionate, and to weep with those who weep, and get angry at injustice. And there's loads of injustice down in our, in, on our patch here. And he's saying, you are God's redemptive agents. What does it look like to be involved? Next one. And well, I mean, it's such a fruitful ministry out there. It's so easy. People are so hungry to, to come to Jesus. And it's easy. It's not scary or anything to share faith. And for the last 16 years, barring one COVID year, we sent out an average of 700 evangelists. So do the math on this. 15 years times 700 evangelists times 14 days, two-week outreach times eight hours a day. That's a lot of seriously intentional outreach. We, we reckon we've seen 170,000 people come to Jesus with all sorts of crazy miracles like demons being cast out and, and uh, blind seeing and, and uh, mute speaking. I mean, just anything from the, pretty much from the book of Acts we could replicate from a story in Burundi. I'll just tell one from the next one. Next picture shows a witch doctor burning his chance publicly, submitting to the highest power. And so witch doctors, are, people are scared of them. They're kind of the spiritual authority out there. So you don't mess with the witch doctor, because if you do, bzz, he'll curse you, and your two-year-old will die or whatever. Anyway, our guy showed up, and uh, he said, he started doing his juju stuff. Uh, and then one of them said, in Jesus' name, he fell down under the power of God. And he came to a few minutes later and said, could you come back in two days? Two days later, he had assembled the whole village as, as our team showed up. And at the preaching of the gospel, him burning his chance publicly, submitting to the highest power, he, 50 people in that village, gave their lives to Christ. That's our Jesus. Now, again, different context from Ealing, but uh, it's the same Lord of all. And he's a big God. And I think sometimes, we, you know, we, he's pocket-sized, and, and we don't, we don't, we don't recognise just how awesome he is. Next one. So this is recent, this is me, by the way, I'm going back there next week, and I was, this is from a couple of months ago when I was last out there, and uh, that is Louis, and Louis two years ago was blind. 
He was a loser. He was a widower. He was on the streets begging. He was just hopeless. And, uh, and then he came, on, uh, he came on one of our outreaches and, and he was prayed for. <laughs> and he was healed. And the thing is with miracles is you just can't deny them. You can come out and meet him. His whole family obviously came to faith seeing the power of God. He's, we gave him some pigs last Christmas and some goats to start a mini business. And, uh, and he, he's thriving now. And uh, he's found some wrinkly old babe to get married to. And he's a happy chappy. And that is the gospel transforming his life at every level. Isn't that beautiful? Next one. And, you know, again, from the Bible, you, you think of that lady, that desperate lady who wanted to reach and touch Jesus because of her bleeding and the shame and disgrace attached to that. And, and, and this was uh, uh, Francine here, and she was desperate. And so clearly you can't touch Jesus in the flesh, but the Spirit of God is with us all the time. And she came on one of our outreaches. Her husband had left because he couldn't have sex with her. And uh, so she was cast out on her own gutted like Louis was and she came on of our outreach and she was prayed for she was healed she was healed she rushed home while she sought out her friend her, sorry, her husband and she said I've been healed baby and and they're back together he's come to faith and all is well again that's just it's just beautiful hearing these stories they raise faith don't they in us next one this is Innocent, and look at him, he's a skinny rake of a man. He's actually just got married, we're praying that he put on, puts on about five, five stone now. But he, he's so skinny because he fasts so much, he's so hungry for God. And again, this is just me a couple of months ago with him. And, uh, and he's got the gift of healing because he seeks the Lord so much. And he's, I mean, this story is nuts. But there were two, two girls who were mute, non-verbal, couldn't speak. And they came after one of, one of the outreaches we did, and, and, and they said, you know, can you, can you, they didn't say, they said, you know, can you... Can you pray for us to be healed? And he took them around the corner, these precious girls that everyone knew in the community were mute. And he prayed, he said, Lord, I will stay in this room three days and praying until, you know, I will hang on that long for you to heal them. Please have mercy on them. And it didn't take three days, it took 10 minutes and they started crying and, and laughing. And then he took them around the corner. It just happened the church choir were practicing. And he came around and said to the choir, I've got you two new members. And they're like, that is a sick joke. And... Uh, so they said, it's a sick joke. And he said, hey, girls, you got anything to say? La! And they sung. And the choir members fell to their, to their knees just and, and crying because that's the power of God. It's beautiful, isn't it? Amen? Next one. Okay, keep going. Move on from that. And again, and again, back, forward, forward. Okay. All right. Well, that's a sign from God that I've spoken enough on that. Right. So if you've got your Bibles, let's look at Matthew chapter 25. And I suppose that's a bit, that gives you a bit of context of where I'm coming from. But uh, also, it gives me the chance to say, if you grab that, uh, I am still alive because people pray. And our guys out there are still doing incredible stuff. Loads of you already do get our emails. So if you want to sign up your email to hear more of these stories, otherwise just pass it on. So you put your details on. It just means you'll, you'll hear from us regularly. Uh, and you hear those stories, and it just, it just stirs faith. It's about as fruitful a mission as any in the world. And that's just objective reality. It's stunningly fruitful. And again, I'll be out there next week and I'll, have, I'll be up in the bush next week. When I was in the bush last time, a few months ago, I was preaching to 4,000 people in the bush and suddenly this lady took her shoes off and wang them at me. <laughs> shoes went either side of me. She was demon possessed. And uh, I know that because after she was led to what was the back, she was prayed for. Those demons were cast out of her. We interviewed her four days later and we've, we're now journeying with her in discipleship. And the demons, the voice inside her had said, and it was at the exact moment when I was preaching for people to come to Christ, the demons said, right, disturb the meeting. And that's when she did it. It was all caught on film. It's just beautiful to see the power of God at work. So sign up if you want to. If you don't, don't worry at all. But uh, they're great faith, faith filling stories. And again, I'll get rid of those now. Those books are at the back afterwards. Come and grab one of those. So this passage, what do you make of it? Those 10 girls, they all invited, they all had a role to play as bridesmaids. And I preached on this actually a number of years ago on the Congolese border. And you know, some, some of Jesus' parables are very nuanced and complicated and hard to understand, and others are more straightforward in terms of what it's saying. I, I would say this is more straightforward. And, and, and I had three points, and I, therefore I'll share the same three points today. And they were, Jesus is coming, nobody knows when, are you ready? Jesus is coming, nobody knows when, are you ready? Now, there I was on the Congolese border, and, and a whole bunch of people responded and came to the front. That's how they do it out there in terms of, uh, yeah, I want to get ready. 
And I suppose some people, maybe towards the back, like think, no, 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 I'm going to sow my wild oats a while longer. Jesus is just going to cramp my style. Uh, I'll turn to him when I am particularly needy, but right now I'm just fine. There might be some of those reactions for us today. Whatever the case, I was on my motorbike a couple of days later, and I was heading towards that village, and I've stopped at a military checkpoint, and they said, you cannot proceed any further because there's been a rebel attack from the Congo, and those people are all getting killed. And it struck me, as never before, the urgency of our message. Because there they were on the Sunday, sat like you guys, hearing, Jesus is coming, nobody knows when, are you ready? And in a sense, on Tuesday, Jesus came, as they were killed. And so, as I share with you this morning, you know, I, I live with a greater sense of urgency than I think most people, because of, of the revelation of, of, of and often living with the sense of the uh, imminence of my potential death. So I had a guy come to my house with a grenade to blow me up. He'd written me a letter saying he's going to cut out my eyes. I've driven along the road, 40 people got killed, listened to gunfire, found out that my, head, my friend's head's been blown off. I've, I've lived with gunfire, with, with all sorts of stuff. And as I said in the intro, you know, you might think, oh, that's horrible. It's so helpful to be exposed to that stuff because I'm still alive today. This is the day the Lord's made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. I'm not going to waste a day. Every day is a gift. Every day is a gift. So it's a heightened sense of reality, if, if you like. It's seeing, seeing life all the more in technicolor. And if you thought you were going to die next week, how would, it's a good question, isn't it? How would you live today? Because you wouldn't spend nine hours <laughs> binge watching whatever set of whatever program, you know, because there's, there's too much to do. And you would ring up and tell everyone that you'd love them, and, and you'd, you'd share the, your own hope, you'd share your faith, you'd be less ashamed, because like, this is, the high, stakes are high, because Jesus is coming, nobody knows when, but are you ready? And you'd prioritize in terms of your money and how you spent your money, and again, I just love the fact that you are clearly a very generous church. But, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd say even more, I want to be even more generous, because anything, as C.S. Lewis says, anything which, which isn't eternal is eternally out of date. It's not going to last. We're not going to take anything with us. And so this passage, you've got those 10 girls, they all had a role, and as often happens, I mean, we're from a, uh, in Africa, be lots of similarities to the culture that's being talked about there, but you know, people are late, you know, if you turn up on time at a wedding in Burundi, you are literally two hours early, no one's there for another two hours. And, and so, but the, you know, if you've got a job to do, like these bridesmaids, they had to be on time, so they're there, and of course the, the party was late in coming, and that's, that, that's all right, and they, they fell asleep, and that wasn't, that wasn't, they're not condemned for falling asleep. The issue is, were they ready? Because eventually the belated wedding, wedding party arrived, and then they sort of wake up, sort of got ready, sort of uh, trimmed, their, trimmed their lamps, and flipping heck, five of them are like, oh no, oh, God, I've run out of oil. Hey, can you lob us some of your oil? And they're like, no, naff off, go and buy your own. If we share, there won't be enough for both of us. So those girls legged it off. Meantime, the wedding party came, doors shut, and it was a party inside, which is a picture of the kingdom. That is the kingdom of God. Celebration. Jesus says, I come and have life and life to the full. We're about joy. We should be joy bringers and joy sharers as followers of Jesus. We've got so much hope, so much reason to celebrate. And then those girls came back, the ones that weren't ready, and knocked on the door. Hey, can we come in? And they heard this horrific pronouncement. Simbazi. I tell you the truth, I don't know you. I don't want to hear that. I don't want any of you to hear that. That'd be the worst thing ever to hear. So first point, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. He says it repeatedly. He says it, for example, in John, John chapter 14, he says, in my father's house, there's, there's loads of room. There's plenty of room for everyone. I'm, I'm very inclusive here. Jesus' offer is very inclusive. There's loads of room in my father's house, and, and one day you're going to get to go there. I'm going to go there, I'm going to prepare the place, and then I'll come back and have you with me. When he was ascending to heaven in, in Acts 1, uh, the, the angels appeared to the disciples looking out and said, don't worry, he's going to come back in a similar way that you've just seen him, and he will take you to be with him. Jesus is coming. He said, I can trust Jesus because everything he said that he would do, he did. That's not the case with everyone, is it? So, you know, in, in Burundi, you know, we, one of our projects is working with street kids, and street kids that, you know, a street kid basically is a, is a thief, uh, because that's how he lives. And he's tomorrow's murderer and, and rapist and rebel, which is why it's so strategic for us to get involved uh, in them beforehand. 
But, you know, I, if, I, if I take out a, whatever, a, five, a fiver, and I say to a street kid, can you just nip off there and get me a, a Fanta, a soda? Is he going to come back? Of course not. He's like, what a sucker mazunga, what a sucker white guy. You know, of course I'm not coming back. No, he needs that money. It's not consistent with his character, but everything Jesus said that he would do, he did. He said, what did he say? He said that Peter would betray him before the cock crowed. That happened. He said that they would all leave. They all left. He said that uh, he, would be, he, he would go to the cross. He went to the cross. He said he'd rise from the dead. He rose from the dead. And so when he says he will come again, I believe him. He is trustworthy. 1 Thessalonians 5.24, the one who calls you is faithful. That's been critical in my journey of 20 years. I mean, now I'm based back in Bath. I had 20 years out in Africa. It's critical for me to believe that promise of God. The one who calls you is faithful. If you're doubting his faithfulness today, no, he is faithful. He didn't say it was going to be easy. He had loads of sucker punches in the last couple of decades. But the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. And Jesus says, I'm going to come back, and I trust him that he's coming back. Jesus is coming. Nobody knows when. Now, that's, that's an important thing to say. Nobody knows when, because you'll have some all sorts of wackos, won't you? Was it Campling not, not a few years ago in America? You know, he was one of those big, big guys that, uh, who ran a sect, and a whole bunch of people uh, sort of aligned themselves with him, expecting Jesus to come, and, and he didn't come. Or the Jehovah's Witnesses repeatedly have said that through their history, and a number of times. One massive time, 1975, they're like, Let's all sell our stuff. We don't need it anymore. Jesus is coming. They're like waiting. No, no, no. But they, they needed to read these scriptures four times between chapter 24 and 25. It talks about that. No one knows. If you looked at chapter 24, verse 36, however, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. Verse 42. So you too keep, must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Verse 44. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Chapter 25, verse 13. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. Jesus said it four times there. Now he's saying it because he wants us to really get it, and he's anticipating that other wackos will say all sorts of twisted uh, teachings. And, and so if anyone says it's going to be now, you can be all the more sure it's not going to be then, pretty much. Jesus is coming. Nobody knows when, but even in that context, Jesus does give a sort of uh, he shares the signs that will happen. So if you look down at chapter 24, verse 4 and following, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and they'll deceive many. You'll hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. And the various signs will come before the end of the age. And just reflect on what's going on in the world right now. I mean, I'm not saying Jesus is coming tomorrow. You know, I'm not trying to put the fear of God literally into you on that level. But, but it's interesting, isn't it? Nation will go to war against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, earthquakes in many parts of the world. Then you'll be arrested, persecuted, and killed. I mean, that's happening a lot, isn't it? The, the amount of suffering in the body of Christ. There's never been as much persecution as there now. You'll be hated all over the world because you are my followers. 300 million Christians live under oppressive regimes right now in, uh, in several dozen countries, 50-odd countries. Open Doors do a watch list of, on that. Worth checking out. Praying for our brothers and sisters going through a hell of, hell of a time. Verse 11. Many false prophets will appear and will deceive many. I, I mean, we have loads of false prophets out there. Uh, in, in Burundi, saying all sorts of wacky stuff that suck people in. But you know what? There's loads of false prophets in, in very different ways. Quack solutions over here. All sorts of stuff that we're suckers for in terms of buying into. Sin will be rampant everywhere. The love of many will grow cold. Well, the love of many is growing cold, isn't it? But the one who endures the end will be saved, and the good news of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear, and then the end will come. And that is actually our remit as followers of Christ, is to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And that's happening. And it's never been, there's never been such a concerted effort as is happening right now. So Jesus is coming. Nobody knows when, but the signs, I've just read out the signs that Jesus is talking about. Famines, earthquakes, persecution, the gospel being preached, all that sort of stuff. That is happening right now. And so, is Jesus going to come in our lifetime? I don't know. But I'm going to live that way in a spirit of expectancy. And I know that we are put here for a purpose. Jesus is coming. Nobody knows when. But are you ready? And that's the big question. Are you ready? Um, am I ready? Am I living ready? And if I'm living ready, am I being part of a move of getting other people ready? Because when they heard that... Pronounce them. That was horrific. I tell you the truth. I don't know. 
at that stage, it was definitive. Jesus has been clear in this parable. I mean, it, it's, it's definitive. At some stage, if our colleagues, if our, if our loved ones, if our neighbors, if they say, God, I'm not interested in that incredible offer of grace. You, you love me so much, you sent Jesus on the cross. Your, your offer, as I said, was so inclusive. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. If people are like, no, God, I don't want that. Well, he will respectfully say, your will be done into eternity. Now, do you believe that? I absolutely believe that. Because I trust Jesus' words. He said in John 3.36, for example, whoever believes in me has eternal life, but whoever rejects me will not see life because God's wrath remains on him or her. Now, let me tell you a, a, a picture, picture story from, from New Zealand. Now, New Zealand, I just, just Googled it now. There's, there's, there's 28 million sheep in New Zealand, and there's 5.1 million people. So it's about a six to one ratio of sheep to people in New Zealand. And I was there a couple of years ago with my cousin, who's got 2,000 sheep. It's quite, quite a good number, isn't it? But you've got some of those farms where you'll have 40,000, 30,000 sheep. So when it comes to the, the lambing season, you might have 100 ewes giving birth in one day. Now, follow this, because, uh, and I even got to really concentrate as I say it, because it's quite complex. So as with humans, uh, you'll have one incident where the, the ewe, the mummy, gives birth to a stillborn. So you've got a mummy and a stillborn there a dead lamb. And in another case, you'll have uh, a mummy who dies in childbirth, but the baby survives. Now, for the farmer, it's not an emotional issue. He's just already lost two units, hasn't he? So it's money. But he doesn't want to lose two more, because the lamb without a mum, a, a mummy, you, is going to die. And actually, the, the mother dies of a broken heart next to her deceased um, stillborn lamb. And so he's already lost two units. He doesn't want to lose four units, but this mummy comes and smells this lamb. It's not mine. She knows what is hers. So she, they cannot be joined together. So there's a big problem. But the solution, as they have found, is that you take the dead lamb here and you cut it open and you come and wash this lamb all over, from head to toe, in the blood of that lamb. And then the mummy comes along. She, That's my boy. That's my girl. And they're united. Now, that's a very powerful picture, isn't it? Do you remember John the Baptist, John 1, chapter, verse 29? John the Baptist saw his cousin, Jesus, over there. He said, behold the lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. What a weird thing to say. Behold the lamb of God. But he was referring back and using the picture of 700 years before of, of Isaiah, who in Isaiah 53 talked about the coming Messiah, the Savior that the Jews were all looking forward to, who would be led like a goat. No, not like, led like a lamb to the slaughter. And a lamb just go, lamb. I've got a video back there at the back that goes with the book. And one of those was I took a lamb and a goat up a mountain to slaughter them. And before you got daggers, you animal lovers, I, the whole point of the video was that I didn't kill them. But, but even off camera, as, off camera, the lamb and the goat lived out exactly what I was trying to illustrate. Because within a hundred yards, as we started off at the bottom of the mountain to go up, I had to yank that chaffing goat all the way up the top. Whereas the, the lamb, within, literally within a hundred yards, I let it go. Still had its, its noose, you know, whatever. But it just, it just, it just came up with me, totally chilled. And of course, when we got to the top, the whole point, I've ruined the end now, but it's quite powerful, but you know, I'm about to slaughter, and then said, no, because Jesus was the Lamb of God who kept the perfect spotless Lamb, who came to take away the sin of the whole world once and for all on the cross, so that we don't have to live on this endlessly repeating, repetitive, tedious, exhausting system of appeasing God each time because he's already paid the price. That's so liberating. But this morning, Mark, before coming to Jesus, you know, God is perfect. And Jesus said, if you want to come in on your own merit, that's Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. God in his perfection approaches Mark without the blood of Jesus and he smells him and he goes, oh, Mark, you stink, you honk, you're repulsive, you are totally unacceptable. But when Mark, when Simon came to Jesus, what happened? The Lamb of God, we were washed in the blood of Jesus from our head to our feet so that now, oh, oh, that's my boy. 
and we're acceptable. And that is, that is, if you are in Christ, that is what has happened. Do you get that? And so there are two groups. Jesus calls out. There's the wise and the foolish. There's those who are ready. There are those who aren't ready. There are those who are, who are adopted into the family. There are those who are orphaned. There are those for, who, for whom it's joyful. For those who are absolutely gutted. Those who are parting. Those who are commiserating. You know. And and once and for all, the door was shut. And they said, "Can we come in?" He said, "No. You've you've had your chance." And all of us, we've had our chance. And actually, our job is is to share this with everyone around. Jesus is coming, nobody knows when, are you ready? And so that is what has taken me to be willing to risk my life in Burundi. And, you know, now, now I'm living in Bath, it's just different kind of challenges. But, um, you know, it's a bit less extreme, but no, I want to still keep on pressing out. Like people on my street, I've got 85 houses on my street, that's 230 people. I know 187 of them by name because I'm intentional about every day, six to seven in the morning, praying out a blessing outside each of those houses. That's where God's put me. He's put you where he's put you for a reason. Feel a sense of commissioning. Engage with people around you. He wants to use you. We're not saying we're any better than anyone else. We're just better off because we're in relationship with the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And I want a number of levels of us to be impacted this morning. I'm thinking for you to realize how precious you are to God. You know, and that he's washed you clean and none of us need to live under any shame or condemnation or guilt. There's been loads of guilt in the name of religion. Enough of that. God wants relationship with you in Jesus. He's paid the price so that you can be set free. And then if you get how much you've been loved, then you will love much. And then we're on a mission as church, as family, as a life group to share this, to draw people on, to invite them to Alpha, to, to just gossip the good news. So I'm closing now, but um, are you ready? And if you're ready, are you living ready? And what's a living ready look like in terms of gospel urgency, in terms of sharing our faith, in terms of prioritizing how we, how we spend our time, our, our finances, our resources. Let's pray. Do you want to stand up, change of posture, have a quick stretch, and then let's pray. Father God, thank you for every, all of us here, brothers and sisters, and some of us actually, maybe, will be clear in saying, now I'm not ready. And this morning's parable is really salutary and sobering. Jesus, you're full of grace and truth. And the truth is that without you, we're in real trouble. And you're inviting all of us. Lord, I pray that none would leave this morning not understanding that picture of grace being picked out of the toilet, being cleaned off the price you paid on the cross. Lord, may all of us know how precious we are in your sight. And Lord, as we think of that, the fact that you are coming back, you are trustworthy, you said you'd do it, you will do it, you are coming. No, we don't know when, although there are plenty of signs going on, that shouldn't fill us with fear, but are definitely sobering and should fill us with anticipation and a sense of urgency. Nobody knows when, are we ready, Lord? May we be ready, live ready, and help others get ready. So, Lord, we offer up our lives to you afresh, all for the first time. If it's your first time, come and talk to me afterwards. If it's the first time you actually get it and you want Jesus to cleanse you, wash you, the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin, the Bible says. So, if that's you, receive that right now. Invite him in. For most of us, Lord, it's, it's again, it's coming again. Thank you that we don't need to offer sacrifices again and again and again. You've done it once for all. We can live free and on a mission. So may we live ready, and may we help get other people's ready, and may we discuss throughout today and reflect on what it looks like in terms of our lifestyle decisions. What's the application of living ready this coming week? Bless us all. Fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, always inspiring and challenging. I'm um, going to offer two things now. We're going to sing our final song, um, and um, uh, you can chat to Simon at the end out the back and uh, pick up on some of his stuff if you want to. Uh, but if you would like someone to pray for you, Tim's going to remain down at the front, and there's an opportunity afterwards just to come and pray with Tim and talk about some of that challenge that Simon gave us. 
this morning. But let's sing our final song as we finish our service today. Father, take us this week, we pray, and let your kingdom come in our hearts and minds. Let your light shine within us and then shine out of us. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you each, every day this week. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us, friends. Don't rush off. Stay for tea and coffee and conversation afterwards. And um, don't forget to uh, ping me an email if you'd like to offer 
to help with hospitality on Friday. Thank you.